everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming. I was having a, a bit of a hard time deciding what to talk about tonight, and I think that that's in part because there's so much to actually talk about. So I'm just going to make a start, and I think I'll leave uh, a little bit of time at the end and maybe prov provo provoke you with some additional um, artworks that I'm not actually going to talk about, but that um, we, might all, we might together talk about. So um, I'm just going to start by showing you a series of uh, slides, and uh, then we're going to go back and look at them a little bit more carefully. So I'll just run through um, these pictures. So this is um, a painting from 1785 called Robert Bakewell at Dishley Grange by John Boltby. So just get these into your into your minds. This is uh, David Garrick as Richard III by William Hogarth from 1745. This is uh, an, a portrait of Garrick, uh, whose sire was Shakespeare, and his dam was Longhorn Beauty, and he was sold for 205 guineas at public auction. And this would be uh, around the same time as the uh, Bakewell portrait, so say around 1790. This is Garrick's sister, sire Shakespeare Dam Longhorn Beauty, sold for 115 guineas at public auction. And obviously, uh, I think we can kind of assume that these paintings were done, the two um, portraits of cattle were done at the same time. This is um, Edu Eduardo Katz's uh, GFP bunny from uh, 2000. And uh, this is uh, Eduardo Katz's Natural History of the Enigma, his transgenic flower. Um, I don't know, you can't actually really see the text here. Uh, it's, I'll just read it. Transgenic flower with artist's own DNA expressed in their red veins. From 2003, 2008. So this is the, the uh, Eduardo part, the red, red paints. Okay. So um, now I want to go back and take a closer look at um, at the, these these works and talk a little bit more about them. And uh, I'll start again with uh, Robert Bakewell um, painting. So with both this Robert Bakewell painting and the uh, David Garrick portrait, um, I want to say that these are performances by the subjects of the paintings and not merely documents. So they're, th they're theatrical portraits. And uh, just to remind you of this, uh, this Garrick painting as well. So if we look at these two paintings, um, Bakewell, Robert Bakewell was um, the master breeder of the late 18th century. He invented several important animal breeds, especially sheep, but also uh, including longhorn cattle. Though he wasn't aristocratic, he fashioned himself, and I think rather awkwardly, um, as this portrait might actually indicate, as a gentleman farmer. So the portrait announces his celebrity in terms of his command of the landscape. Um, we can see that these animals in the background represent some of the breeds that he has invented. And uh, they, um, they announce and they also naturalize his intuitive and unorthodox and actually sculptural breeding practices. Uh, and his method of breeding was called in and in breeding. And it was a very specialized form of inbreeding uh, where uh, specific traits were picked out and privileged and he bred in very carefully to enhance those, those traits. So I think that um, what I want you to start to think about are the implications of 
these kinds of breeding methods for the animal body. And this is a time in, in England where um, the, the nation is rushing to address the needs of a burgeoning urban market for meat. So uh, one of the breeds that Bakewell invented was called the Bakewell Dishley Sheep. And uh, this breed was especially developed um, to produce an extremely fatty mutton uh, designed to fe feed the industrializing and urbanizing working class who were no longer able to look after their own food production because of the enclosure of common lands and because of their forced entry into um, industrial production uh, as factory workers primarily. So uh, Bakewell's principle, like begets like, a tenet of close inbreeding is perhaps something that we might want to think about as we sort of move through um, the rest of these artworks. And I also just wanted to show you um, that this, that all of these ideas started, were starting to permeate throughout the common um, media, common uh, mass culture in the form of, uh, for example, this, um, this cartoon which uh, basically l lumps, and I guess the pun is intentional there, but lumps together right. the, um, these oversized animals, which really was a style of animal in this period, um, with this uh, working class uh, man who's clearly seen as one of the, one of the animals. So, um, so I want to talk now, move on, and talk a little bit about the uh, Hogarth painting. So I'm just trying to throw out some stimulating ideas about uh, breeding and genetics and thinking about how that, how that affects the way that we think about uh, using genetics in contemporary art. So that's sort of the direction that I'm trying to take you in. So in Hogarth's uh, painting of the master actor, so we had the master breeder and now we have the master actor, David Garrick. We see Der uh, David Garrick in his role here as Richard III in Shakespeare's play. So uh, Garrick as Richard has just woken up from a dream in which his murder victims are haunting him. And I think that this might be something that will resonate with us, uh, with us later when we start to think about the, um, the animals and their relationship to the bio, the bio artist and, and some, of the, some of the controversy that's swirled around um, some of the work that's been done with animals by contemporary artists. So I think this painting is more than a portrait as it shows the uh, subject posed and poised at a very specific moment in a fictional plot based on a real history. And we all know, I think, that Shakespeare's history plays were um, not particularly accurate in terms of how they told, told history. So that's another layer of um, putting different kinds of fictions to, together to tell some kind of apparent truth. This is also a defining moment for art history in which uh, Garrick's pose becomes a common pose for portraits of actors. I, and I mentioned already the theatrical portrait. So I think that the, this pose starts to become reproduced as well. So um, keep in mind that both the Bakewell and the Garrick paintings are also artworks. They're produced by working artists whose position as laborers or working artists um, is something that we should, we should keep in mind. And John Boltby, the painter of the, uh, the cattle portraits, um, was a kind of agricultural laborer. And um, as Elspeth Moncrief has reported, uh, John Boltby was the first artist to specialize in cattle painting. And uh, without an inheritance or any kind of um, wealthy background or family, he had to uh, generate a reasonable living for his wife and eight children from cattle portraiture. So his introduction to Robert Bakewell was important because it led to further commissions from eminent cattle breeders. 
And um, he has a very famous painting, and I'll try to show you uh, the, the painting at the end of my talk, of uh, the Durham Ox from 1802, uh, which is considered one of the best of the many portraits done of this uh, celebrity animal. So we also have, we have celebrity portraits and we have celebrity animal portraits as well. So both of these portraits, I think, work to underpin the status of the gentleman farmer, the gentleman breeder, and the public celebrity who takes on multiple personae in an era that I'm going to frame as an era uh, like ours, full of the free play of genetics. So if we move on and we see that um, in the cattle portraits, we have um, a... A, uh, a, a, we have cattle named for David Garrick. Uh, and clearly the um, lineage has, is a literary lineage. So the father of David Garrick, the, the, uh, the, the cattle David Garrick is called Shakespeare. So I think that that's really interesting in terms of um, how uh, genetics becomes a, a, in, entangled with art even in this, in this early period of, of breeding. So uh, in the portraits of Garrick and the other portrait of Garrick's sister, um, I want you to understand that these are advertisements. They are intended to puff, which was the term of the day, or promote the idea of um, genetic soundness. So the painter's uh, commission was to present these animals in their best light and through them to show off the gentlemanly status of the owner breeder of the animal and to promote the animal's beauty and soundness uh, as a stud in, in the case of Garrick or as a breeder in the case of Garrick's sister. And Harriet Ritvo, who's an environmental historian, has specifically pointed to the ways in which such depictions emphasize the animal's mass and grandeur as a way of symbolically enhancing the stature of the animal's owner. So this is a very, very much part of this, um, this, these portraits that they're to, they're, they show off the animal, but they also show off the owner of the animal. So I'm going to contend that even um, great actors and great writers can be rendered animal can be engendered and gendered and made infin infinitely reproducible in a really um, visceral, physical kind of way. And this also creates a connection to bio art regarding the persona of the artist and his or her place in the artwork. And I think that this is something that's really uh, contestable in terms of the way that some bio art artists talk about how they see they, themselves in, in the work, and especially around um, genetic manipulation. So um, early modern animal breeding catalogs and then fragments animal identity to divorce animals from their own holistic and bodily experiences of place and of uh, their own heritage. Uh, what might naturally happen if the old system existed where cattle were put on common land and bred much more freely. This is a very controlled kind of uh, industrial, pre-industrial kind of situation. And um, this is the beginning of the period where studs would actually be moved over long distances around the country to service um, different farms and to, uh, and it creates a kind of monoculture of breeds. So um, you would have had uh, local uh, stud services, but this is really a, a period where you start to see, uh, you know, somebody like Garrick is, uh, is actually let, rented to uh, a farmer for a fee and stays for a, a designated period of time and services as many um, cows as, as possible. So this is a kind of an interesting change in terms of uh, how we're moving uh, genetic material around. So um, if we think of the breeder as an artist, and I think I'm trying to kind of take you in that direction, uh, we could suggest that there's a kind of violence that's committed on an animal. And, um, 
And, but simultaneously, there's an, a, sort of an amazement or a wonder that's part of this, this process. And um, this kind of self-conscious impetus towards individuality and sameness simultaneously, I think, is really interesting and comes out in some of the um, contemporary discussions around artworks that, that are being produced. So. Um, I think that there's also an interesting kind of tension that's created um, around the sort of containment and control of genetics that's kind of inherent to, um, to the practice of genetics uh, that begs the question of whether uh, creativity and genetics are impossible at some level. So we, can we have our cake and eat it too? Can we really really be artists and use something so um, rigorously controlled and, and necessarily controlled as, as genetics. So let's talk a little bit about Garrick's sister, move forward. Um, so Garrick's sister is interesting because um, her potential individuality or subjectivity is completely subsumed into the identity marker Garrick. She cannot have her own name. She has to be associated with the celebrity uh, Shakespearean actor um, and uh, brother Cattle uh, Garrick. She, her gender is important, um, I think, in terms of the imperative of reproduction. Um, but both economically and conceptually, she's of less value than her celebrity brother. So she only sold for 115 guineas, so almost, I guess, like 90 guineas less than her, her brother. So, um, so I think that that's something to keep in mind, that gender, the, the value of, of genetic material is, is gendered in this period, and we can see, maybe talk about whether it is in, in the contemporary context. Um, standardization also abounds in the poses of these, these animals, in these animal portraits. And uh, the cattle turn, their flank, turn one flank towards the viewer and fill up quite a, quite a substantial portion of the, the frame. Um, and uh, the backgrounds of these paintings tend to be generic. So uh, the replicability of both the artwork and the animal becomes increasingly intertwined and further emphasized by the proliferation of print technology. So this is of, of interest, I think, to the, the uh, Center 3 um, print side, um, in that sales of uh, print editions of these paintings would, would also be part of the um, kind of s spread of their, um, their genetic material, I guess, metaphoric genetic material. Um, and even in a 21st century artificial insemination environment where stud services are um, male, male order, and I guess I can pun on male and <laughs> male order, um, breeding stock is still pictured and um, product guaranteed on the basis of lineage and celebrity. And I'll just show you um, two pictures. This is a, a ram letting a painting of ram letting from 1810. So you get a sense of the, um, these, um, these animal technicians in their white coats uh, showing off uh, the, the product for these uh, gentlemen farmers who are uh, assembled in a barn. And you can see that uh, people are lined up, gentlemen are lined up to, to get in um, to this uh, letting. And so, of course, uh, there's competition for uh, access to the best, the so-called best rams. And then I also wanted to show you just an example of a contemporary advertisement for, um, for beef, cat these are beef cattle. And I think you can see that it's very similar, that we're, they're using the, you know, the sim similar kind of visual language and also these, an emphasis on naming as a way of conveying um, uh, uh, information about the quality of these animals. So we have um, on demand, red hot, sure bet, Red Bull, Bravo, and Ebony's influence, this lovely guy here. 
So um, they are, they, all of these um, animals are numbered and uh, they're all, um, they're, their lineage and their, their um, genetic um, quality is that that information is very made very apparent and I think also the uh, picturing of the animals would be uh, would uh, transfer a lot of a lot of information to those who were knowledgeable about these these kinds of um, animals and what would be what, what would be good traits because obviously they're beef cattle so they're they have a specific purpose so they would look at things like um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the strength of the back, the, the uh, flanks, and uh, et, et cetera, leg shape, and, and so on. And um, so I just think it's really interesting that, the, that despite the fact that all of this is done through Canada Post, or you know, it's probably Courier, but um, the, 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 pur the purchasers of uh, semen want to see these uh, these portraits at the at the same time so I think that that's also uh, uh, should should be of interest to us in our exploration so finally I'm going to move to the uh, contemporary and talk a little bit about um, some of the artwork so I think that this is similar I mean I think it's really apparent that uh, there are a lot of similarities between um, this very famous um, uh, document, supposed document of Eduardo Katz's um, GFP bunny and what we've already been looking at. So um, I'm going to suggest that, uh, that this is also a puff or an advertisement because the GFP bunny does not really glow or appear green except under very specific uh, circumstances. So clearly uh, Katz wants his artwork to be seen in a particular light, no, no pun intended. Well, yeah, I intend, I intend all my puns, but um, <laughs> the, the portrait of the GFP bunny is intended to generate a particular effect in the viewer, uh, to generate wonder, and to underline the value of the artwork. Now this, now Katz, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the whole story about uh, this particular artwork, but Katz um, uh, specified a particular uh, rabbit and named this rabbit Alba. And uh, this name allowed the animal to acquire an identity and a kind of pet potential. So pets, as you know, um, are distinguished from other domesticated animals by several, uh, several factors. They're named, they live in our houses, and they're not eaten. So um, Katz intended that Alba, this particular, his particular uh, GFP bunny, be liberated from the lab in France where she was invented or created um, and decontextualized from her reality as a lab laboratory animal who would eventually be euthanized. Um, but his goal of taking Alba home was never realized. And uh, I think that this, this is a kind of uh, important part of this puzzle so that, uh, that it's important for us to think about uh, Alba, uh, his presentation of Alba as singular and individual and special and the reality of her being just one of many GFP bunnies in this particular lab in, in France. So I would also argue that as with Garrick's sister, the potential subjectivity of Alba as an individual rabbit is subsumed in the more sensational identity of the celebrity fluorescent rabbit uh, Alba. She has been kind of, as an individual, she's been kind of sacrificed in favor of what she is able to represent. And I think the gendering of that is also wor worth reflecting on, particularly because these GFP lab rabbits are injected with the dye largely to facilitate um, ovary harvesting and experiments to do with reproductive technologies. 
So um, despite Ed Eduardo Katz's protestations, the animal rights controversy around his GFP bunny is a conversation worth having. And uh, at a certain kind of dangerous level, I, I almost wish that, uh, that he had, that this had actually been the subject of his artwork, that, he, that the artwork be more about the condition of lab, lab animals and this, these kinds of practices being um, naturalized in, in terms of how animal experimentation takes place in various institutions. This happened to be a European institution. Um, but I think that obviously that would violate, to do that kind of art would, would also violate the individual animal in some other way. So let's move on and look a little bit at um, this other artwork by Katz, the um, Edunia from the Natural History of the Enigma. Now because Katz puts a, a part of himself into this artwork, I think it much more poignantly and sentiently, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those concepts in a few minutes, engages with uh, the issues I'd like to see foregrounded more in bioart. So uh, the gene cats selected from his own DNA um, is an immune system gene responsible for the identification of what he calls foreign bodies. And he intentionally chose an immune system gene um, and he, said, he says um, on his website that in this work, it is precisely that which identifies and rejects the other that I integrate into the other, thus creating, I'll finish the quote, a new kind of self that is partially flower and partially human. So Katz uh, further claims that by using the color red as a metaphor for blood, in a visually dramatic way, I bring forth the re or I bring forth the realization of the continuity of uh, life between different species. So what we end up with, I think, and this is what I've been trying to do for the last however long I've been talking, is um, the creation, uh, a complex entanglement of genetics and art. So we have the creation of animal bodies as works of art. We have artists like Shakespeare and Garrick conceptually embodied in animal bodies. We have genetic material made available for production and reproduction. And uh, the animal breeder, the artist, the farm laborer, the lab technician, the scientist, the consumer, about to tuck into the meat on his or her plate, the art consumer posting GFP bunny on his or her Tumblr site because it's cool. I'm suggesting that these figures, all of these figures are also bred in a certain way. And I think that that's something to think about. And I, I've been calling this the genetically modified gentleman slash artist. And I think, you know, for, for us, I think it's, uh, often on a thinking level that uh, we, the, the bunny is cool and we don't think very much beyond that in terms of the larger issues that the bunny raises. We sort of take the bunny at face value as being kind of wondrous and, and I'm not, I would never deny that it's not wondrous at a certain level and cool to look at, but I think that we need to think harder about, uh, about that. So um, this is where I want to kind of take you to, towards what I'm calling a sentient genetics. So if we can, if, if what I've been trying to convince you of for, for, uh, since the beginning of my talk, if we can consider breeding in the 18th century and bioart together, um, as I am proposing, and if breeding and bioart are selective genetic practices, are they also sentient? Are the values and practices of breeding and bioart reflective of uh, one who feels or is capable of feeling? And what I would what I would expect from a sentient genetic practice would be um, would include uh, self awareness, uh, attentiveness to the breeding process as experience, 
as a felt body of knowledge and as an embodied practice. And this is what I would call um, maybe the poignancy, uh, considering the poignancy of the altered subject. So uh, a perception of the continuum of life uh, that eschews detachment and pr promotes empathy and affect feeling as a way of championing genetic practices that feel for and care for whatever being is being manipulated. So this idea of sentient genetics is not to turn necessarily to ethics, although that's one of the places that you could go with this, but rather it emphasizes that breeding and bio art, uh, in breeding and bio art, the artist is um, not and cannot be distinct and separate from the process and the product. And I think this is an idea that in Edunia, Ed Eduardo Katz has tried to foreground, but I don't think that we as uh, art lovers and uh, art consumers, I don't think that we're picking up on the nuances and the depth of what he's trying to do adequately. So what are we missing? So um, I wanted to um, just take us back quickly through um, some of the things that we've already seen. So I'm gonna just look again at this portrait at Garrick and at the, the bunny again. So um, we need to see these works as portraits and not as landscapes. And Raymond Williams writes that uh, a working country is hardly ever a landscape. So we need to think about the many layers of labor in genetics. Read as landscapes, these works adhere to Raymond Williams' important critical perspective where landscapes imply separateness and observation where order is created uh, for the viewer along with prepared social models and analogies from elsewhere to support and justify a particular aesthetic or a particular way of looking at this this work an order uh, being projected while it was all while it was also being composed and that's those are williams words uh, I think that a sentient genetics also um, includes uh, self-conscious looking um, where the identity of each individual uh, involved in the artwork or the genetic um, change is uh, actually essential to the work of art's success and, and to address the kind of pervasive tension between the idea of individuality and the imposition of standards and uniformity. So I think that we need to, um, to also think about that tension. Can we, again, it sort of takes us back to that question I asked before about can we really be creative in genetics? Is it possible to be an artist and work within a system of control? Um, and especially because it's such an industrialized system at this point in time. So, um, I think that that was basically um, the, the end of the formal part of my, um, my presentation um, where, where I'm asking for, for, for an interrogation of the border between self and, and non-self and I think that that's what Katz actually suggests that he's doing in his piece. And I just wanted to th throw out a couple more pieces um, that are you know, quite well known, I think maybe some of you have probably seen these before, just to um, maybe stimulate your thinking further. So this is Patricia Piccinini, the Australian artist. Um, this is a work from 2003 called Still Life with Stem Cells. And uh, you, you see this, uh, this child um, cuddling these life forms that are um, probably monstrous and um, unnatural at some, at some level. So I think that that's a really stimulating and interesting work to, to think about in terms of what I've tried to raise tonight. And, um, and then, of course, um, Stellart's uh, famous um, prosthetic ear that he had implanted onto his forearm um, as a, a way of offering him more, uh, more hearing, enhanced uh, hearing. So I think that you know, this is a highly provocative work as well and was um, developed uh, in, a, in the lab. 
and, uh, and, and so on. And, uh, and then um, Christian books, the Xenotext experiment, um, where he has introduced, um, uh, he's created a poetic text and translated into, into genetic form, uh, integrated into a cell, and then there's, it, it's rejected or expressed by the, uh, the cell in a form of protein, and uh, he's, he's hoping, he, this is still ongoing, he's hoping that the protein will uh, write poetry. So um, that's, uh, that's the, the plan with this, this work. So, um, and just to, to finish, this is, uh, I think, uh, one of the most impressive of the animal portraits of the 18th century, and I, I think, in, in fact, probably is, is leading us towards abstraction at some level. So again, in thinking about the animal body and genetics, um, we're getting into um, this, maybe this idea that anything, anything can be done in genetics, anything can be done in breeding, and we can create an animal that looks, I think to our eye, completely unnatural at, at some level. So um, thank you. And um, we can, yeah, we can continue. And if you want to write me a letter or <laughs> there's my, my contact. And uh, I have taken some of this material from an earlier article that I published in 2010, um, which focuses much more specifically on Robert Bakewell um, and, and not at all on bioart. So, um, so thank you.